Welcome to Down to Herf, the podcast for cigar smokers, whiskey drinkers, and for the people just looking to kick back, light up, and have a good time. I'm your host, Jerry, and I'm joined by, as always, my co-host, Gio and Caleb. Fellas, 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 how are we doing on this fine Saturday night? Caleb, what's up? Bros, it's always good to be here. Glad to see you guys again, and uh, we'll be drinking some good stuff and smoking some good stuff as well. Gio, what's up, my man? Well, first time, you know, in two weeks recording a main episode. Missed the last one with Jake, but, you know, good to be back. Feels like, you know, my chair still, you know, fits right. <laughs> <laughs> it's got that, like, uh, meticulous feel to it, huh? Yeah, the right indentations. Well, listen, we have a uh, really awesome guest tonight, and we have a fantastic cigar, but before we get to any of those, Caleb, what are we drinking tonight, my friend? All right, tonight we have Starlight Distillery. We have Carl T. Hubert's Signature Indiana Straight Bourbon Whiskey. So this is a 94, a 92-proof bourbon whiskey. Uh, it's been aged for four years out on Huber's Farm. So this is made in very small batches, so we have a blend of... They're three grain and four grain mash bill. So their three grain is corn, rye, and malted barley. This is also blended with their four grain. So you have corn, rye, malted barley, and wheat as well. So um, this is a fourth generation distilling family out of Indiana. Uh, it's pot stilled and out of 53 gallon American oak barrels. So man, we put a dent in this as you can see. This is great. Uh, this is a uh, post intro, I guess you would say. Uh, we, <laughs> post intro. Yeah, we we have done some damage on this bottle tonight. Uh, yeah, we're Tarantino in this. We guys, you know, you're seeing the end before the beginning. Wow. And uh, there's no there's no foot fetishes involved in this filming. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> like in all this. No, not me. I don't know, bro. I, I see you after her clips. I hate, you watch some weird shit. But I hate feet. Hate feet. Not a feet guy. Not a foot and guy. Uh, that being said, Geo, do you want to kind of <laughs> introduce who we're going to have on? All right, guys. In a few minutes, we are actually having the one, the only Skip Martin from Roma Craft Tobacco on the show. It's been an interview we've been trying to get for a little bit. Looking forward to it. And we are smoking a very, very, I guess, as he described it, quasi-limited release. This one is pretty much a one-off. It won't be back ever again once these are gone here but the quinquagenario this one is a celebration of skip's 50th birthday it's the first and a two-parter that i learned originally it was supposed to be three but the next rendition will be coming when mike rosales of roma comes back around his 50th birthday comes around and I was going to say, uh, yeah, let's get right into the interview. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, hey, and without further ado, guys, Skip Martin. Something new. Oh, Bardstown. Good stuff. We did it on the show before. Wait, is that the Fusion? That's one of them, yeah. Now, this is uh, Ferran. That, is that the black and gold bottle? Yeah. That is, uh, oh, that's the oh, right. new one, yeah. That's good stuff. How the I, fuck do you guys get that down there? Uh, Jeff always brings bottles back for me. From, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, nice. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Got the goods. He trades me for cigars. <laughs> hey, that ain't a bad gig. <laughs> yeah, you know. Good thing. Vice for vice. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, you just let us know when you're ready. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a nice yeah, bottle pop there. Good popper. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, I don't have my headphones, so. Yeah, it is. You sound pretty good. Yeah, you sound good to me. Yeah. All right. Um, there's no echo or anything for you, right? No, just the bugs and the monkeys and the. <laughs> I I like it. It brings a degree of authenticity to the recording. It's kind of fucked up, dude. That like you you can actually say that, and it it's like yeah, there's probably fucking like wild monkeys and shit there, right? Yeah, there's a. I don't know what you call it. Is it a Pride of monkey? What do you call a, a group of monkeys? I think it's like a pride of lions. A pack? Uh, a pack? Family? I don't know. I don't yeah, there's probably the about we call a probably, uh, the household. There's probably about thirty of them. They come. They come up. Sometimes they come up like two or three feet from the glass. That's crazy. They, they get really close. We had a. Uh, 
we had a papaya tree right here and we had to take it down because they were they would come to eat and, and basically they could jump from the tree into the patio so i took the tree uh, down hell no <laughs> I, I, yeah. I'm good with like a squirrel or something being on the porch, a fucking monkey. And monkeys have, they're stronger than you think they are. Oh, I uh, believe bro, it. Bro, we said it on the show. Yeah. If if monkeys were around, like squirrels and stuff like that, you couldn't drive to work or get in your car. They would just fuck you up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of all the things. All right. Well, uh, are you good to go? I'm ready when you guys are. All right. Cool. Hey, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely good to go. Gio, why don't you introduce our guest, buddy? All right, guys. We're here today with founder of Romacraft Tobacco, Skip Martin. Welcome, Skip, to the Herf. Nice meeting you after PCA here. You know, been looking forward to getting you on, actually. Yeah, you guys spent a while in our booth, I think. We were with your booth. In, <laughs> yeah. a, in a way, we were with your right. booth. Okay. Uh, yeah, we were with Mikey and them. Uh, Honestly, I got to say, it was a great time at the show this year for us. Uh, we got to meet a lot of cool people, uh, got a lot of cool cigars, made a lot of good relationships. Uh, I'll be honest, we, I didn't talk to you as much as I thought we would have. I mean, I know you guys are busy slinging cigars and stuff the whole time, but, you know, it was so cool meeting you. Yeah, I don't... Uh... I, you know, I just make, I mostly just make cigars. Mike, Mike's really the one who sells them. So the trade show for me, I don't really spend a lot of time in the booth. I don't blame you. It probably has to get a little boring sitting there after a while. Like, <laughs> especially if you're not a sales guy. But no, I think the part I appreciated most about PCA was the story time that we had at the Espinosa gathering the one night. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty fun. There was a, I learned about your uh, your ashtray uh, escapades. <laughs> My ashtray story, yeah, that's a, that's a crowd pleaser. Got it all set up here. But uh, anyways, I mean, we brief you about it here for the show. We are smoking the Quinquagenario, uh, very special cigar. I understand, you know, first of a three parter that you guys are doing. Uh, two, because you know oh. Esteban's not part of our factory anymore. So, oh. um, probably, I think next year is Mike's year. 24 okay. so uh, i don't know when he what he's planning on doing so uh we'll see yeah i was lucky enough that uh the first time i met you you handed me one of these and i smoked it and i gave this one the hype i was like guys you gotta do this one when it's available very, very yeah good. you know mostly what we what we do is uh we don't really do limited edition cigars so whenever we come out with a cigar, uh, generally, um, we'll go out and source the tobacco for, you know, two, three years for that cigar. Now, we do have sizes that we don't make a lot of, like Lanceros or Panatellas or stuff like that, box press cigars, things that we make in, you know, five, six hundred box runs, you know, every year so that so that people do have things that are limited for events and for, you know, our regular customers. But, um, we, we really, we've never made a cigar where there's a fixed number that are going to be made. And then, uh, then that's it. Right. So the, the process of making that kind of cigar is a lot different because you never have to make it again. So, um, you know, some people say, they found this limited tobacco and decided to make a limited cigar, which is, I guess maybe that's true sometimes, but um, most of the time people kind of make limited cigars the way, you know, lunch ladies make Friday lunch, you know, where <laughs> it's whatever's laying around, you, 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 you make something with it. This cigar, um, the, the idea behind the project, because I called Ernie, uh, I was going to actually make a cigar with Ernie uh, for General Cigar. Uh, I was going to redo the El Rico Habano, uh, which was one of his first cigars that he ever made. And then, you know, that kind of fell up. But working with General is a lot harder than you would think. So I kind of lost enthusiasm for that early on. And, and Ernie basically, you know, said, look, you know, maybe this is probably the best idea. But when my birthday was coming up, I told him that I wanted to 
come to the Dominican and, and work with him because I wanted to learn more about Dominican tobacco. You know, a lot of times when people are talking about Nicaraguan tobacco, you'll hear Jalapa, Esteli, Condega, Ometepe, you'll hear the region. So it's Nicaraguan Carrillo or it's Nicaraguan Corojo. And now they also have Nicaraguan broadly. But you, you, but when you talk about Dominican tobacco, very seldom do they ever talk about, they'll talk about the strain like San Vicente or Allure, but they generally won't talk about the region. And so I didn't know a lot about uh, the, the differences in tobaccos from one region to another. Uh, we've always used Dominican tobacco since we started making Cro-Magnon. Uh, and we use this specific tobacco um, from Penuela that Leo Reyes makes or grows. And um, so I started doing a lot of research on Dominican regions and, uh, you know, talked to a bunch of people. And then when I came down there, I said, hey, here's a list of 20 tobaccos. Am I missing any? And we sat for half a day just going through different the history of Dominican tobaccos and when it kind of came down to it there were two or three that I was really interested in so then we then we spent the first the first week that we were together just going and sourcing tobacco and so uh, you know what I was looking for was uh, to, to try to make a cigar that was 100% Dominican uh, we ended up not being able to find a Dominican wrapper that we liked so um, the wrapper's from Ecuador, but everything else in the cigar is Dominican. So, um, and the, the cool thing about it was whenever we found a tobacco, it really was, you know, the six dusty bells in the back of the warehouse. Because I, I don't, if you're going to make 50,000 cigars, you only have to have, uh, you know, about four pounds per thousand. Uh, or I'm sorry, 40 pounds per thousand. So you're talking about 10 pounds per thousand cigars, about 500 pounds for any given filler. So when we when we ended up making that cigar, the binder and two of the fillers were tobaccos that just doesn't that don't exist anymore. I mean, there's one there's one tobacco in there that uh, a number of people said it was their favorite historical Dominican tobacco, but the farms where it was grown on had actually been purchased by the government and they built a highway through that that area. So that region doesn't even exist anymore. And there was very few people who still had any of that tobacco. And, you know, contrary to what people used to say, when you let filler sit around for 8, 10, 12 years, it, it doesn't always get better. So, um, you know, we started with, with finding that tobacco and then uh, kind of went from there. But... What's great about it was being able to learn, but then more than anything was finally working on a project where I didn't have to figure out how to make it for the next 10 years, right? I just had to figure out how to make 50,000 cigars. So, um, you know, we were able to do something really cool and, you know, it took a long, it took probably a year longer than it probably should have taken. But, uh, yeah, we're, I mean, I, I like it. So, it's a Dominican cigar, but it, but it tastes like it tastes like our cigar, you know. What was it like working with Ernie on the cigar? Because I know well, he takes a lot of pride in his products and what he puts out. And I mean, uh, year after year, he puts out, you know, uh, these fantastic cigars that do so well in aficionado. And I, I mean, it's got to be pretty amazing working with a man like that. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, I've known him for a long time. When when I was like in my early twenties. Anytime I would fly through Miami, I would try to schedule a time to go by uh, his little factory on Calle Ocho. And so I've known I've known Ernesto for, you know, more than you know, probably almost 30 years. And so, uh, you know, I knew him as a consumer. And then uh, a friend of mine won his like golden Chevetta thing where they used to roll cigars in big smoke. So I kind of got to know him a little bit more through that. And then um, as a retailer, you know, I, I, I would run into him at the show and we would talk. And then I ran into him here as a brand owner. And then I ran in, you know, and then, I, then the next time I saw him, I owned a factory. So, you know, he's kind of been a mentor of mine through all those different stages for a long time. He's, he's probably one of the nicest, most polite kind of old school guys. Um, 
but at the same time, he's also very stuck in his ways, right? So he's, uh, which obviously, I mean, I am too, and he's been doing it, you know, way longer than me. But the thing is, he um, he has a, usually if someone comes to him to make a cigar, it's he goes and blends cigars and then presents samples, and then those samples are you kind of choose from it, right? And then he makes those cigars the way he wants and, you know, to, to the specifications of the one that you like. Um, I don't know if he's ever uh, done what he's done with me, which is, you know, we, we would literally sit in the office and, and have these kind of heated discussions about everything from how to bunch and how, how people were going to get paid, how the labels were going to be applied. I mean, every little step of it was kind of this, uh, you know, back and forth and uh he certainly was never he's not accustomed to working that way so it was uh it was new for him and 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 you know he can get you know kind of dug in and i can too so um you know the the benefit of that is it's kind of this constructive friction right where something good comes out of people having different perspectives yeah and at the same time you know, he had a new factory manager. He historically has always managed his factory, but he brought this guy in from Habanos. Uh, he used to be kind of the raw material guy at Habanos, and he was like the VP uh, in Europe. He came in to manage his factory, and his kids are kind of becoming more involved. And so the at the same time, he was kind of trying to have to let go stuff to me. Uh, these guys were like using me a little bit to kind of push oh. him. To, to accept some changes. So it was, it was a, it was a really good experience. And, um, you know, one of the things was we were in the process of figuring out how to, what we were going to do in terms of the factory. And one of our options that, that was out there was, you know, to sell or close the factory and then have our cigars made in other factories. And so, one of the objectives of this project was to see if we could make a cigar in another factory uh, to, the way that we wanted to make it. And, you know, it's not as easy as you would think to, to you know, because I'm so specific about the way we do things. Um, it, it's, a, it's a lot harder than, than you would think it is. Yeah, I mean. But, we're, but yeah. we're proud of it, so. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you're very meticulous with what you do. I mean. And especially, you know, you're working with, you know, El Padrino in the industry, you know, guy knows his stuff, but, right. and going into that. So obviously you're one of the most, uh, you know, unique blenders out there going with what you're doing. There's not a lot of people that, you know, have been able to do anything like you guys, in my opinion. And so now going with that, like going with Dominican tobacco, is that something, you know, to touch on it? You said you went through, so you're smoking like binders and fillers just to get that individual flavor than to like mix it together or is that more? Yeah, so of course. I mean, of course, yeah. like it's, uh, you know, if you're going to make a recipe, right. Yeah. Um, you, you know what onions taste like, you know, what garlic tastes like, you know, what, um, you know, to make different tomatoes taste like or whatever. So when you're making cigars, you have to know very well the component pieces you have to know them individually. And so I've always, you know, my thing is build up this kind of library inventory of knowledge about all the characteristics of a given tobacco and then figure out how they work together. Right. So for example, if you were going to, um, if you were going to write a, like a piece of classical music for an orchestra or whatever, you would have to know what a flute sounds like, what a clarinet sounds like, what a trumpet sounds like, you know, what different percussion sounds like. Because even though you're writing the the, the piece, you kind of have to know which instrument's going to come in and do what parts, right? Yeah, and I can promise you a, there's no Mozarts or Sebastian uh, Bach box in this room. <laughs> zero <laughs> musical talent. <laughs> yeah. Zero musical there, talent there's none. whatsoever. There's zero in this room. I could promise you that. None whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah, the you know the, the thing is though you know I always think of flavors in the sense of sounds really you know if, if, if I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember 
like when you used to have a radio in your car, you had these two little eight inch speakers. Maybe they had a, if they, if you got them from Crutchfield or something, maybe you had like a, a little tweeter or something yeah, in the middle the of it. But really all, really all you would hear is mids, right? So, so you, you know, you'd put in a cassette or a, uh, an eight track or whatever, and all you really hear is kind of the mid frequencies. And then later on you, you could get, you would get like a subwoofer and then you'd have the bass lines oh yeah skip i had uh two 12 inch subs in the back of my 96 taurus in the day <laughs> that does not absolute me. fucking <laughs> loser <laughs> yeah but well, then, i was listen, like 16 if, years old you, you hit but my language really... right there i grew up in a puerto rican neighborhood so it was <laughs> funny <laughs> funny enough, all trouble <laughs> funny enough geo my car got robbed of my two subs in your neighborhood back when i was in college hey dog <laughs> But if you get really high end, you know, then you add like the tweeters and, you know, all that stuff. So um, wh what you're trying to do is you're trying to have different frequent, uh, a broader spectrum of frequencies. Right. And so a lot of tobaccos, when you talk about flavor, there are base kind of tobaccos like Ethelie Lajero or uh, Condega uh, Lajero or uh, Broadleaf. Those are kind of like base flavors. Uh, then you have these sharp flavors like Ometepe or Jalapa or uh, San Vicente or, you know, those kinds of things. Ometepe, I think, is a, a very good example because it's a very specific flavor and you can overdo it, right? And then you have tobaccos that if you made a whole cigar just of that tobacco, it would taste good. Cuban tobacco is a very good example of a mid-tobacco. And the reason why Cuban cigars are, are boring to me is because there are no sharp, distinct flavors in a Cuban cigar, and there's no, there's not enough kind of base notes or strength or body in a Cuban cigar. So, if if you were to take kind of like like we do with Wonderlust, for example, you take Esteli, which is a base kind of flavor, and then and then you take Matafina, which is a really sharp, distinct flavor. And then you take the Cuban tobacco and, the, and the, what, we, what we call Pueblo Nuevo, which is another Nicaraguan tobacco. You have all three layers. So you get a more rounded kind of uh, flavorful uh, cigar. So, you know, what I kind of found in the Dominican, the, the tobacco that we always use in the Dominican is a mid. Um, it's a Criollo tobacco, Criollo 98 from Penuela. And... There's not a lot of really deep, heavy tobaccos from the Dominican that aren't, you know, kind of treated in some way, right? Um, and then there's also not a lot of really sharp, distinct flavored tobaccos from the Dominican, but we were able to find kind of both of those things just by experimenting. So, yeah, you, you smoke, you, you get different tobaccos, and then you have a guy roll a little cigar, you let it dry out, and then you just smoke those, and you go, okay... How does it burn? How does it smell? How does it, uh, um, is it, he you know, is it heavy? It, you know, is it a base, a mid, or a treble? Um, you're looking at, you know, very specific kind of, is it acidic or is it uh, alkaline? Is, does it make you salivate? Does it make your mouth dry? Um, all those things. And then what you try to do when you're, when you're blending a cigar is, you don't, you want to kind of create this broad mix of, different characteristics you know if you use a heavy tobacco you have to use a lighter one so that it burns right if you use a base tobacco you have to use the other two as well if you use uh, something that's really sharp you, can, you know as a wrapper like Matafina then you've really got to bring out a lot of heavy notes in the filler to, to take away that sharp flavor right so you do have to understand the components really well so for the second week I was there and the third week I was there, really all I did was smoke individual tobaccos and take notes on them. And part this was part of what frustrated Ernesto, I think, because he's like, okay, just, you know, pick these three things and, and we'll start making cigars. And I'm like, no, 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 I got to understand the tobaccos first. And he's like, well, I could tell you what's good. And I'm like, well, you know, part of this is me learning, you know. Well, this is and probably so, why this um, is a three-year project, huh? Yeah. <laughs> right and, right and, and so why, this is a banger of a stick too i've on my third one already and i 
you know. Yeah, I've had the a, opportunity to smoke quite a few of these, and I got to say, the aroma this cigar gives off is a lot different than a lot of cigars. Honestly, it's very unique. Um, huh? I don't really know how to, you know, describe it, but I mean, it's very different compared to a lot of cigars that I've smoked, and I don't know if that's, you know, the Dominican tobaccos, uh, but. Yeah, that's you guys what it nailed is. this I mean, thing, man. This thing is this thing is this is fantastic. Thank you. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a cigar. You know, people will talk sure. for for hours and hours about their master blending skills, and uh, you know, I just make cigars that I like. Um, I don't even know that this is the cigar that Ernesto liked the most. Um, he kind of stopped telling me because <laughs> I would just argue with him, so he kind of just stopped. <laughs> Just fucking pick you know? one, man. Fuck. He's just let's get these things like, out. Okay, just, just at some point, he was just like, just just do what you want to do, and then and then give me <laughs> sample, right? And then yeah, if man. you know if it doesn't completely suck, then we'll just go with it because it's you know this has gone on too long. So, um, but especially kind of more as he smoked it more and more, and people in in his factory and and people in his sales office in Miami, as they started smoking, they're like, holy cow. Um, this is way different than anything we've ever made. This is, yeah, uh, this is really, really good. And, uh, you know, p- part of, part of things being different at first, maybe you don't recognize how much you like it because you're focused so much on how different it is. And then as you smoke it, you're like, okay, wait a second. You know, this is def- definitely something that's, you know, uh, you know, remarkable. So anyway, it was, it was a great experience. So skip besides uh, your 50th birthday, what other things inspired you to make the cigar uh, from wrapper binder filler and, or was it just getting into Dominican stuff or was there any other inspiration behind it? Uh, I mean that it was, can we make cigars in another factory? We never have. Um, if I go, if I go spend time learning about, you know, to, to learn, I, I got to make it worth their while, make it worth my while, right? And then also being able to spend time and learn from Ernesto. Um, you know, the way we bunch, for example, is completely different than the way they bunch. And it's not like I can come in and say, okay, this is the way I want it made. Because you, he has, you know, 60, 65 rollers or whatever that never roll in any other way than the way he wants it rolled. Like, for example, in our factory, we, we use a method that requires what we call a base leaf. So you put a base leaf, in our case, a lot of times it's something like Jalapa Seco, and then you, uh, you bunch in the hand into that base leaf, and then you use a Lieberman, uh, and it kind of works like a second binder, but really what it's doing is it's, it's allowing you to use uh, multiple bunching so we use some some cigars. We use uh, book booking or or estufado. It's kind of like uh, some of it's tubes, like intubado, and some of it's uh, booking. Where and it's it's just it's a different way of bunching. And so when I went there, it's like and I'll, the other thing is we always use four or more filler leaves. So we'll use the base leaves in three fillers. Um, a, which allows me to make cigars that have, for example, the BA has three Lajeros and one Viso, right? And that shouldn't work. That shouldn't burn. Um, the Neanderthal has a real heavy wrapper and a real heavy binder. That shouldn't burn, right? And so um, if, if when you tell people on paper what a blend is, they're like, no, there's no way that's what it is because it, sh- it shouldn't smoke correctly. Um, but because of the way we we bunch, we can physically construct the cigar, it worked. And, you know, of course, I learned that uh, from Esteban. I didn't know anything about making cigars before I came here, uh, you know, 13 years ago. Um, that's my basset hound. That's all good. <laughs> it's the Mahler yeah. monkeys. <laughs> um, well, I saw a flash of lightning in the background, too, so I wasn't sure if you got, got a storm going on there. No, it's oh, just kind flash. of the edge of the world. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so anyway, so you're going into this, this, this process in another factory. So you have to learn how they do things. And there's, there's a, some things that just are immovable. You know, they're fixed variables. You can't change the way that they're, 
you know, bunches are going to make cigars. So, so it's not just about picking out the tobaccos. It's saying, okay, if I was making this in my factory, this is how we would do it. And this is, I know it would work, but now you have to actually physically, for example, when you're making a cigar and you're bunching it in your hand, you break off tobacco at the bottom, right? We have a process where, you know, you set that on the table and you put certain tobaccos back in if you need them. Some sometimes you put the the fuller tobacco in the front, and sometimes you put the lighter t- tobacco in the front. And they weren't used to distributing the hand the break the same way we were. And so, you know, part of that is has a lot to do with keeping it consistent for me. And so, you know, getting them to do it that way changes how many they can make in a day, which changes how much they can make, which changes how much you have to pay them. So, um, you know, pay, having people who do things every day do things a different way for one project um, kind of throws a whole kink in the whole process. So there were a lot of those kinds of discussions where, you know, where we, you know, just went back and forth. <laughs> so I won some and I lost some and, and you know, that's, <laughs> But, but, you know, the end result was fantastic, though. So a real winner, I would say. Yeah. People talk a lot about collaboration, but really there isn't a lot of collaboration in this this business. There's a lot of marketing, co-branding and those kinds of things. But in terms of actually really blending and making a cigar, um, usually it's however the guy who makes it is going to do it. And uh, whatever tobaccos he wants and whatever tobacco, you know, processes he uses. So this cigar in, in that way really is a real collaboration. So maybe one of the first, you know. Got it. So um, I know whenever Mikey goes down there, you know, to blend something for Pestania, you're like, no, it's my way. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a good example. So, you know, I, I made Mike learn tobacco the way I learned tobacco. And then he... And then he picked out the tobaccos he wanted. And, you know, you know, it's kind of like I always say, it's kind of like when you take a, a three-year-old bowling, you put those things in the gutters, right? You know, you're not going to let them, <laughs> you're not going to let them, you know, go off the, the rails, the rails. But, um, you know, he did choose the tobaccos that are in that cigar, but how it's physically constructed and stuff like that. I mean, you know, it takes years to learn. So basically, at the end of the day, it was made the way that we make cigars, right? So touching on that, I did want to kind of get into like, obviously, this is the first time we've actually sat down, had a little discussion. I kind of wanted to get into the origins of Skip Martin. Uh, Obviously, uh, some people know that you were a Navy man, correct? Yeah. um, Well, I was in college. I studied economics played baseball. And then, um, I joined the Navy. And when I went in the Navy, I, I went to nuclear power school in Orlando. And okay. then, uh, curveball. Yeah. yeah then I went, luck, dude. Yeah. <laughs> so then I was, um, I was an engineer, you know, an engineer on a submarine. That's what I did in the Navy. Nice. Thank you for your service, by yeah. the way. Yeah. How long were you in the Navy for? Uh, almost six years, six years. Did you like your time on like the boats and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I really liked it. I probably would have stayed in for longer. Um, I ended up, I ended up uh, breaking my knees, and so I had to get out. Uh, how, how did that happen? Long. I got hit by a piece of equipment while we were mo- uh, more. Hold on a second. My dog unplugged my thing. Oh, <laughs> that's all right. Those things happen, guys. Smoky cigar, smoky in here, man. Absolutely. But hey, it's great cigar, anyways. Bass and hounds are the most annoying breed of dog. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. When they when they get annoyed with you, they just fuck with you. He knows exactly what he's doing. Oh. <laughs> so I had a pit bull that was like that. Twelve years, just whenever there was like food, he would purposely like try to knock like a table thing over or something. Dogs. <laughs> Sometimes we don't deserve them as humans, but other times they know exactly what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. So no. Skip, we talked a little bit about uh, the na- oh there there's your dog, is <laughs> in the picture. There we go. So we talked a little bit about you in the Navy, but uh, and it's part of your beginnings. But I want to know b- before we get into how you started Romacraft and all that, what was a young Skip Martin like? Uh, his interest 
And where did your love for cigars and cigar culture uh, begin? Well, um, so there was an officer on my boat who um, smoked cigars. And when we would go in and out of port, he's, he's this dog, man. When we would go <laughs> in and out of port, um, you know, in the, in the sail of the submarine, the uh, when you go in and out of port, you're obviously doing it above water. And so the kind of the last people to come onto the boat um, while you're on what's called maneuvering watch are the, the officer of the deck who's in the, the sail and a phone talker. And so uh, I would always want that duty so I could kind of sit up there, go in and out, you know, watch the dolphins, do all that stuff. So I kind of learned early on that uh, that if I if I brought cigars for him, that he would always select me for that job. <laughs> so um, so then I got I got to know a uh, uh, a guy that owned a restaurant in Virginia Beach. Then we started smoking a lot together, and that's kind of really where I got into it. Um, and then you know, I, I kind of. <laughs> Sorry. That's all, don't worry about it. Listen, I'm we like the authentic, he hasn't authenticity. He's been noise all day until this started. <laughs> it's all good. That's usually how it works, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you know, I, um, in Virginia, I, I had a, a cigar shop, Emerson's, that I used to go to. And then, um, I, uh, when I moved to Chicago, I, I got involved with a, a, a store there called Up Down. And then when I moved back we're, to Texas, when I was, we're big when fans I came of to, Up Down. So Phil's a good guy. We like Phil. Yeah, good guy. Uh, well, back then it was Diana Silvis. Uh, it was her shop, and then, um, and then when I came back to Texas um, to work for Dell Computer, um, I you know I found a new store, and then we had a we had a vacation house in Galveston, and when I would go down, we'd go down to the vacation house. Um, there was no good cigar stores down there and i had a buddy of mine my roommate from college who was a police officer uh he kind of got involved in wanting to open a cigar store so he kind of pulled me into it you know and i was thinking i'll be able to buy cigars at cost so why not (laughs) this uh this This sounds sounds awfully familiar because geo and i are actually police officers so Mm -hmm. and i don't know if it's just the culture of police but you cannot get you can't get away from cigars yeah. It's just there's just nothing like having a cigar with the with the guys at work. I don't know. It is uh it's definitely camaraderie making for sure. <clears throat> so yeah, so I had a, a retail shop and then the shop got hit by a hurricane. Ike, right? Yeah, Hurricane Ike, and then um the uh you know, I used to take consumers to trips to factories. And what I kind of learned going to the factories was is there, they had a lot of these cigars that they were like abandoned private labels or they were blending prototypes or just things that they had abandoned. And I started buying those and selling them in my store. And uh, after the hurricane, there was one in particular that was very popular. And, uh, you know, I started working with Rosales to uh, recreate it because we were going to open a new store in Austin. And then we launched that basically just to friends. I mean, I had a mailing list from my store, but, you know, at that time it was kind of early social media like uh, um, MySpace and Twitter. And Tom, your I had. A, was Tom your best a, friend? It was Geo's yeah. best friend. Totally. <laughs> Everyone's Tom? best friend. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we. You know, we created that cigar, started selling it, started selling more of it, and then eventually it kind of out, sort you know, outsold all of the cigars that Mike was making for his own brand. So then, when when we had to kind of really focus on making that on a regular basis, um, that's when it was like, well, we got to be involved in the factory because we have to fund you know the purchasing of tobacco, and then we we should probably just close your cigar company and open a new one. So that's what we did. So my understanding is your your first actual cigar with Mike was the the Cro Magnon, right? Right. And then my understanding is you pretty much rolled these out of a garage. Well, uh, Esteban at that time was 
kind of the G- GM or chief of production of Scandinavia. Uh, and so we built a, kind of a little factory behind his house. Um, the first ones he did roll really in his garage and on weekends and at nights. And then um, for the first six months to a year, we, we made him in this building that we built behind his house. It was probably 300 square feet or something. We only had like two or three pairs. Uh, in 2014 was when we actually opened the, the factory that we're in now. But so it was, it was four years after we started Cro-Magnon. Yeah, Cro-Magnon, another great line. The Neanderthal, it's funny you brought up the punch for it. Anytime this guy has one of these at work, I know we're not doing shit the rest of the day because he's melting <laughs> in a chair. So that's one of my favorite cigars, actually, uh, the Neanderthal. Uh, pretty much any size. Uh, the, the NH is really good. Uh, the JCF I really like, too. Um, some of my go-tos. When I'm when I'm looking for like a nice nightcap with a with a bourbon, but uh, I mean if these were regular production, I mean I'd probably smoke a lot more of them. But I was fortunate enough to get four of the five thousand boxes, <laughs> like two thousand boxes, or oh, two thousand. Oh, sorry, oh man. geez, they're even more rare than I thought. I thought yeah. it was, it's only fifty thousand, so I'll I'll take what I got. I got almost a hundred of them, so I uh, really really enjoy this cigar. I, I mean I really in general like Roma Craft. It, Everything you guys put out is great. Um, the Baca, you guys just said, uh, love, what was I the love Baca? The, love the Baca. There was a new Baca I think you guys just put out, right? Well, we release it every year. Just like a limited but, size? No, they're, they're, it's the same size as, as, uh, as Cro-Magnon, but just uh, we only do it once a year. Mm. Yeah. If I drink this whole bottle, I'm going to be really fucked up. Please do. It'll make, it, <laughs> we'll make it'll, for some good, you know, entertainment. Good, con- good content. How is that bourbon, by the way? How is it? It's it's really good. It's um, I don't know what the proof is. It's one ten. Oh, I got so, some little heat for that. Yeah, so it's not barrel. Uh, it's barrel is usually one twenty, one thirty, right? It's uh, a little fifty five percent, one ten proof. Yeah, I don't even know what the story is behind Ferrand. So Bart Sound's been doing a lot of collaborations with like little breweries and stuff, and they're just finishing their products in a lot of like beer barrels and stuff. Yeah, they did Founders. Uh, there was another one there's, they just dude, did there's too. Too many out there. Some yeah. you you don't even hit stores because they're out. They're sold out locally where they source from. Bart Sound does well, a good job. I gotta be honest with you. Like Jeff told me it was good. I trusted him. So <laughs> I I like that. I don't know the whole bullshit story. Right, because you know it either tastes good or it doesn't. So, and I I have no idea how much the bottle costs. So, I'm gonna go with probably over a hundred. Those fusion series like that. They're yeah, Bart Sound side, usually yeah. is right around like their lower end stuff is like eighty, and I know right their lower end <laughs> stuff is eighty dollars, uh, and then their higher end stuff and the collaborations usually can get up as high as I've seen like a hundred and seventy bucks. So, yeah. Uh, obviously, I don't, he, he, I don't drink as much bourbon as I, I used to. I used to drink Booker's. That's that was my oh, that was line. my thing. But man, you have expensive well, tastes, yeah. man. Well, yeah. Booker's was twenty seven dollars a bottle. Yeah. Well, now <laughs> Booker's to, to if it's not al- I mean, it's all Dude. allocated. Just to get a bottle yeah. of Booker's is a big deal. We uh, we talk about like Blands all the time, but Booker's again used to sit on the top of the shelf, fifty eight bucks. No one would buy it until Christmas time. Now it's allocated. Now it's one hundred fifty bucks. Dude, in Austin, Booker's. Uh, was twenty seven bucks, but but uh, every every one Tuesday a month, they the twin liquors would have what they call the twin deal, so you could get two bottles for twenty seven bucks. What? What a wow. deal! I hope someone's yeah. holding on to those bottles for uh, maybe secondary resale. I'm sure some somebody money. is, and the bottles yeah. are probably worth a thousand dollars. Some of those, yeah, we yeah. we I actually got to meet um, Fred No. When we went to, because Jeff knows all these guys in uh, um, in Louisville, he's a he's a bridge away. Uh, I've been to Riverside. It's a really really cool shop. We're actually going for Caleb's birthday uh, next next month. month. Yeah, he's really good. He's really close with Rutledge from Four Roses, so that's the one I've been to the most. But we went to Jim Beam, um, and actually, my daughter lives because my daughter married uh, Jeff's son Hunter. Hunter, yeah. So. Um, the one trip we took, we went to Jim Beam, and uh, I ended up 
getting a bottle of, uh, it was a really rare Booker's. It was like, uh, not the rye, not, because we have all that, but the, it was like, it was called, uh, something Booker No, or I don't remember what it was. It was, called, a no, it was probably like a no pick, I think, right? Because he, yeah, I, but he it's like, it's yeah. like, you know, now the bottle's worth like four thousand, five thousand dollars $5,000. So, um, but you know, if you know me, I'll just go into the office and just one day I'll decide that's what I'm going to drink. And <laughs> you got so, it like that, man. You, I mean, you, you got the connects, uh, obviously in Louisville. Um, Hunter's yeah, really good to us. I always, I keep in contact with him, uh, about, you know, just like Roma Craft, uh, Phosphoro, Pistagna, when I'm looking for things and they're a little hard to get here in Buffalo. So, uh, I always reach out to him in Indiana. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Him. We just, um, so Jeff and I, um, so Jeff's been asking me to make a cigar with him for years and, and I really don't do that kind of thing. In fact, like making the cigar for Palestania, I wouldn't even do if it was today. Because I can't even make enough cigars for myself, right? But because we agreed to that early, early on, we still make it. Uh, but Jeff asked me later on if I would make it, and I said, dude, I just can't do it. So when when, when the baby was being born, uh, our granddaughter, um, I said, look, I'll make a little project uh, for this. And so um, we took a lot of the tobaccos, kind of weird. Sometimes when you're buying tobacco, you just find something you're like, I don't have no idea what I'm going to use that for, but I want it. And so you just have kind of this library of weird tobaccos. And so, um, so we, uh, we, we all kind of put together this, of course, my blend was the one that we picked, but <laughs> no, because, big deal. You know, it's like no big deal. Thing. The, be- the best. Yeah. The best. Yeah. It had to. Well, it's like, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, you're dealing with guys who 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 aren't who don't do it every day, right? So, but I was, gonna say, um, was it close or was this like you know that forty to seventeen beat down Texas handout earlier? <laughs> yeah, it was like that. It was like that. It was like the forty the Giants uh, Cowboys game. Oh, um, forty nothing. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So, um, but we made this this cigar, and um, so we came up with this new because there's we have a lot of these things that I want to do, but it but they're only going to be whatever tobacco we have, we'll just make these little projects. And so we have this craft series that we do every year. And so um, I don't know if you know, like when architects make, make buildings, they make little, little models of buildings. Okay. And those things are called maquettes. It's like, or sculptors, if they're going to do a big, you know, huge marble sculpture, they'll, they'll use a little model to kind of work out how they're going to do it. Uh, is that it, how you it, do the craft packs every year? No, craft generally is is just tobaccos we already use, and we make a, a hard, a really hard to make size. Um, so, so what, what we what I decided to do is to, to create this new thing called uh, craft maquette, which is, you know, whatever we make. If it's going to be twelve hundred or fifteen hundred, it's just something fun to do, and and we do them all the time. Uh, and I end up smoking most of them, but <laughs> but it's one of these things where if one of them is really really good, then let's make enough so we where we can release a hundred or two hundred bundles of it and release it in a single store. And also because Hunter and my daughter are are broke as fuck, I said, look, uh... I'll make I'll make this I'll make this project and then I'll basically sell it at cost. Jeff will sell it at cost so you guys can can put some money in the bank so that you're not constantly asking me for money. I'm, I'm already looking yeah. forward to it's the, yeah. the El Nono, right? Or no, no. Yeah. The, the El Nono, the, the grandfather, right? Yep. Yeah. I read about so, this. Uh, yeah. Super cool idea, especially for you and Jeff. Obviously you guys are both the grandparents to their kid. That that's, that's a really cool project. I got to say. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and we, we already have three of them made. So the next one is um, lightweight, heavy, which is uh, a cigar that we blended when Sean from our office was down here. Uh, you met Sean at the trade show, right? Yeah, that guy was cool. We uh, we yeah. went to dinner. Uh, it was me, Mikey, Boots, uh, Greg, 
Gio and me, uh, like, obviously, you've seen, we're all big guys. I mean, we somehow fit, uh, I think there were seven of us in this, no, yeah, six of us in this little-ass car to go to the sushi, the sushi place. Uh, That was a fucking clusterfuck, the car ride. Sean was just kind of sitting in there like this, and, I mean, it was just the most uncomfortable you could possibly be in a vehicle, unless you were the driver or the passenger. I rode trunk. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so every time Mike or Sean or anybody comes down, they're always like at the table going, hey, can you make this? Can you make a Neanderthal HN, but make it like a GD, whatever, whatever. And and people will make some cigars for them. Um, So Sean came down, he went through our little tobacco school, and um, which is a pretty cool. You guys should probably come to that. It's really cool. I would love to do that. That oh, sounds um, amazing. It's, fucking awesome. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not fun. By the way, it's it's grueling work. <laughs> I believe it. Which, which which they can all tell you. It's like well, I signed up for this thinking I was gonna you know have a good time, but really <laughs> I just ended up getting nicotine sick and oh, shit. you know. But um, <clears throat> so Sean created this blend from tobaccos that we had, and I, I thought it was really good. So we we've always made him like you know some. So he constantly has them to give to people. Mm-hmm. So our second maquette is Lightwood Heavy. Uh, he used to work at a store in Maryland. Um, um, the Tinderbox, well, it's not called Tinderbox anymore. Uh, I don't really know what it's called because they got sued for copyright or something. But uh, Raj, who was his old boss, so Sean's going to do an event in Maryland where he releases the second one. And then the third one I'm going to do is I'm doing with Alex. Who's our, uh, who, because I live here in San Juan, Alex is kind of my eyes and ears at the factory when I'm not up there. So, um, uh, we're doing one with Alex and Alex is like a total, um, uh, you know, tobacco geek. So, um, that'll be the third one. So it's just something where we go out, buy a couple packs of tobacco that we think is really special. And then we make something with it around it and then uh, release it in a single store. So um, that's a cool thing to, you know, kind of keep me occupied, I guess. So is that how, like, the Frenchie came about, but a little bit larger scale? Like, I know that was for Jen and Oliver, obviously. No, the Frenchie happened because uh, we were in between cycles of tobacco, and the the Habano we had was too light uh, to make Aquatine or Whiskey Rebellion. And so we were in the process of making saber tooth and all we had was this lighter tobacco. And, um, so I said, well, what if you did a reverse barber pull like we did for black Irish? Um, so that, so that we only, we only made, I think you know, 1200 or something of them. So, um, or whatever it was, 2400. Yeah, this is this is another. He's a box collector for you guys. I got a bunch. <laughs> Smoke yeah. that. I somehow got a bunch. Smoke that that Frenchie too. Oh, there's such a great those, cigar. Those the good. inverted saber tooth is awesome. I'm also a big fan of the yeah. the saber tooth itself. Uh, Black Irish. Uh, that's one of the cigars I I look forward to. I mean, such a great. I'm not even a big Candela guy, but that cigar, it's just it's blended great, man. I mean, it's so awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and then John took a job with. Uh, general I, yeah he took a job with general like right when i was supposed to come out and so he was like okay it's the, okay fuck you we're gonna just sell it <laughs> so, all right listen i got a question all right because i did i yeah. criticized one one thing about the cigar all right why the fuck did you guys put the sticker on the outside on the cellophane or on like the out like why couldn't you just like press press it into the box somehow so it was, and I don't mean to, to call be, you out. I'm just asking. It was supposed to be screen printed. Okay, where the where the tiger is. Sure. Yeah. But because I was here, they didn't do it, and they made they made 140 boxes with the tiger on it. So instead of having them sand it down and, and re screen print it, I was like, "Fuck it, we'll just buy a sticker." And then they bought. <laughs> oh, this, and then they, they didn't they put it the, on the. And then they put it on the outside after they were because wrapped. because it was already in Austin when they when they put oh, the sticker on. There you go, that yeah. makes sense. 
So yeah, it was it was completely not characteristic of the way I do things. But at that point, John had left, and I was like, "Fuck it, <laughs> just get it out there, put it on the yeah, ship." Yeah. It. Yeah. That was uh, yeah, that was a funny thing. We I think we talked about that, and someone watched when we talked about it, and they made sure they commented <laughs> explaining it. Yeah, they oh, reviewed. Yeah, that, yeah, that, 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 that was you. Okay, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we reviewed it on the show, which I I thought it was a great cigar, by the way. Uh, but yeah. that was my one. That was my takeaway from it. I'm like, why the hell did they just not fucking put the sticker? At least the sticker on the box. That was our. It, a, that was our after her review, right? No, no, no. That was, oh no, was oh, that was a regular episode. episode. Yeah, regular episode. I'm getting confused here. Yeah, I, I was so frustrated at that point. I was just like, "Fuck it, I don't care." <laughs> well, <laughs> at first they were just a little project. He, it was like a almost like a giveaway cigar for him, right? And then he left, and you guys put him out in boxes, correct? Right. That's what it was supposed to be. Was it was supposed to be a cigar that he would just give away, and then you know whatever. If you got it. You got it. Yeah. Yeah, because like I get. Listen. We see here, you know, your boxes usually always have yeah. some, you know, regalness to them here. You don't cheap out. So it was just a very, like you said, very uncharacteristic. We were confused. Well, I'm glad we're talking about all these cigars that you got coming up recently. Is there anything else new in the works that are up and coming out soon or in, or in 2024? Yeah. So our big uh, release for next year is the, the new Cro-Magnon. So... We, um, we bought a lot of broadleaf in 2014 and we've been using that since 2000, or I'm sorry, 2018. And, uh, we haven't been able to find any Connecticut broadleaf that we like since then. So we, we stopped making Cro-Magnon in October of last year. And, um, I bought, uh, I started buying Pennsylvania broadleaf. So Cro-Magnon Starting next year, it's going to be a new version with Pennsylvania broadly. Okay. That's what I'm smoking now, actually. There you go. A little fresh smoke there for <laughs> yeah. you. Now, just to touch on this, obviously, you're someone I can ask about this. So I hear like Connecticut Broadleaf is essentially just getting very almost like teetering on impossible to find from like manufacturers. I don't know if I've read that correctly or we not. We talked about it on an episode. <laughs> yeah. There was a yeah. uh, heavy flooding and there's a, a flooding that happened, right? We did well, there's always it. there's always one issue or another: hail, flooding, cold, whatever. Uh, climate change has had a big impact on the yields. So, um, you know, there's two ways you buy Connecticut broadleaf. You either the way we always bought it was we all you know we only use a certain kind of cut, a certain kind of texture, and we just it just became impossible to buy it that way. You either have to buy the whole crop, and then. Um, you know, people like people like uh, Nika, uh, Nika Prosa can do that because they make a lot of machine made cigar. They provide a lot of tobacco to machine made cigar makers, and they use the best of the best for like soccer cigars yeah. or Nick cigars. Yeah. But um, for us, it just wasn't possible to buy it that way. So um, the majority of, of of Connecticut broadleaf is is used for machine made cigars. Because it's not really suitable for handmade premium cigars, um, so we just had to kind of move on from it. Um, we just we just can't find it. So um, we reblended the the new Pennsylvania broadleaf is a completely different cigar. It's really good. Um, we're going to change the color of the label so people don't think we're trying to substitute something without without telling you what it is, and then. Um, you know, if we find the old school broadleaf in the future, then we'll make Cro-Magnon again. But um, the new one is really good, too. To be honest with you, the original Cro-Magnon is so heavy that that it's like once you smoke one, you're done. Right. Even more so than Neanderthal, I think. Um, so the new one, you know, I smoke them kind of all day long, which is nice. Is that where you're going with that green wrapper? Because I've been seeing some pictures that you've been putting out. Is that going to be the new wrapper for that? No, no. He, yeah. I, I saw, I saw you put out a couple different. Uh, maybe it wasn't a poll, but you definitely had like a picture or something that showed a couple different variations of a potential wrapper or, uh, you yeah. know, a label for it or a, a wrapper for the. Yeah, I'm, I'm still working on it. Um, I saw one I liked a lot. Yeah, uh, I don't know what color it's going to end up being. <laughs> You know, of course, you, you make something, they go, oh, this looks like, you know, Tatuai. This looks like Umbagog. Yeah. So 
I think I'm going to you know, go a whole different direction. I don't, I don't know. I might end up doing gold on black or, or yellow or something else. So That'd be sweet. I, I don't know. That yeah, looked nice. I saw this post now. Like it was yeah. like it was, it was Pennsylvania all the red- yellow or something like that, and you're like, yeah, yeah. fuck. <laughs> but I saw a couple of people comment on it, like Palmer and stuff like that. And he's like, oh, I like that one. Yeah, but right. Speaking of which, I got a quick question. It's a it's a little random one, but I'm gonna throw it out there since we oh, talked boy. a little bit about Mikey and Pestania. So if you're stuck on a deserted island in the middle of nowhere, and you got to choose from Mikey, Palmer, or Boots. Who are you going to pick to survive with on this island? <laughs> Greg. <laughs> That's good. All right. I should have included a fourth option. No, no, no. You, you didn't meet Greg, Caleb, but uh, Greg, that actually kind of makes sense. Yeah. Gre- Greg will like organize the resources and figure out a way that everyone's going to survive. And No, Greg's not doing any work. He's just there specifically to kill shit. So. <laughs> Well, that's a good answer because you do need someone to kill stuff so you can eat and survive. Mikey would eat too much of the food by 6 a.m. Make sure he made his workout. <laughs> yeah, he's got to get all his protein intake. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what Boots would do. He'd be killing stuff, though, I assume. He would be looking for something to fuck, I think. <laughs> <laughs> a coconut. And uh, Palmer might just talk your ears off, so you got to take all that into consideration. You know, th- those guys are, it's a great example of, how you take people who are all completely different and somehow it works. Sure. So that's what, you know, <clears throat> we've worked with them for a long time. Oh, yeah. How did you meet Mike? Yeah, that's what I meant to ask next. So that works perfectly, Jerry. Um, I mean, we were talking think, about like, the, like a Boston kid who ended up in Florida and somehow now owns like a, you know, a, a very reputable cigar shop. And runs the number one cigar podcast on, on Podbean. Podbean. <laughs> <laughs> well, Got to throw that uh, out there. We're on that network, so yeah. I I think what happened was they were a big, you know, they they did like vape and you know uh, glass pipes and bongs and they had a gas station and then they opened up that thing, the head shop or whatever they called it. Um. But when they started getting into cigars, they were selling a lot of Drew Estate. And then their Drew Estate rep fucked them. Something something happened with Drew Estate right at the right time when we were coming out. So I think they basically told Drew Estate to go fuck themselves. And they brought in Cro-Magnon. And uh, it kind of started from there. So, But then because they came down and, and because we started making Pastania, um, you know, we just become really good friends. Great guy, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, course. without him, you wouldn't even be on the show right now. I mean, we we had uh, we had to uh, have him reach out to you. And we were like, "Hey, man, I don't know what the fuck happened." I sent him the link. Yeah. I I sent it to your email. I don't know if you got it. Maybe it went to the junk or something. But uh, you know, yeah. I I, re- I I was like, "Hey, Mike, maybe you can reach out to him. I I know you know him personally, so maybe we could just figure something out." Or he's fucked up watching the fucking uh, Longhorns game. I don't know. I had I had like six different college football games going. So, <laughs> so you know, I, I'm watching the Texas game, and then I'm watching. Well, I'm watching USC Colorado, and then I'm watching the Texas game, and then I'm watching uh, deceased because we're playing Oklahoma next week, and Oklahoma is Mike's team, oh, man. and uh, us beating Oklahoma is probably more important than winning the national championship. So that makes I'm sense. Really, I'm I'm doing a lot of focus on the Oklahoma Iowa game, so yeah, he sent me the message, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I guess I I completely forgot." You throwing any good bets out there? Are you a betting man? You got Fanduel out there in Nicaragua. I'm I'm not a better really uh, at all. Okay, so I'm, I'm that guy. Though, right? who, they got beat by the Cardinals, man. I I it's hard to take them serious. I love winning, but. <laughs> Like if I lose five dollars, I want to burn the whole casino down. So I'm, I don't, you know, I don't really. Sounds like me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, get I really have no exactly. problem buying a box of cigars for three hundred and sixty bucks, but you, if I lose five dollars on a fucking bet, so I'm like, I'm, I'm all of a sudden going to my bank accounts. I'm like, what the fuck. I'll never find I don't know what it is. I, this guy, I am with you. He lost the free bets that they give you when you sign up, and he was pissed. <laughs> I'm upset about it. I'm mad. 
But yeah, I mean, obviously not to get too much into football and all that, but I'm sure Texas SEC Arch Manning going to be starting there probably next year when Quinn Ewers goes pro. But man, Ewers might win the Heisman this year. He's looking really good. Oh, that, um, that might be a bet I might have to take. <laughs> he's looking really good. I mean, you know, I'm a Cowboys fan too, so I don't ever get my hopes up <laughs> too much. Uh, sorry, sorry to do that to you there, Skip. Boy. Yeah, I don't get my hopes up. Um, it's kind of like being a Bills fan, where you know, even uh, if you're no, no, stop. Uh, yeah. Listen, you got us twice. Just you, you, stop. He's already <laughs> dead. <laughs> yeah. You, well, I know you guys. You guys are friends with Tommy, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, so Tommy is uh he is uh really in the bag for the uh the Bills and you know it's almost as bad as being a Cubs fan, I think. Dude, we yeah, but at least they won a championship a few <laughs> years back. It's all right, I'm a Pats fan, so you know Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> well now I'm not doing I so feel hot. like uh so Daniel Tosh does you know who Daniel Tosh is? Yeah. All right, so Daniel Tosh does a joke about the the Miami Dolphins, but I'm going to substitute right now his joke for the Bills. Uh, it's being a Buffalo Bills fan is like getting tested for an STD. I think I can win, but I know I don't deserve to. <laughs> yeah, because if you're getting tested, you're already in the loser bracket. <laughs> so uh, it, it kind of is like that. It, it's just it's horrible being a Bills fan. Like we're like, oh, I think we can win the Super Bowl this year, and then you're just like. 13 All seconds. Right. Yeah, thir- <laughs> we can't even win a game with 13 seconds. Well, everybody's so excited about Josh Allen, but like Josh Allen's a lot to me like Favre was in the early years. You oh, know? I was going to say, a man, lot, don't, don't don't get crazy right now because that guy is he's definitely a top five quarterback in the league right a now. A lot of picks, though. I get that. I got a question. Since we're a little bit on football topics, and, and just be completely honest with me, if you could redraft right now and it's – the Cowboys team right now, their exact team, except quarterback. You can pick between Josh Allen or Dak Prescott. Who would you take? It doesn't matter because Jerry Jones is going to fuck up whoever you <laughs> All pick. Right. Right? I'm, I'm talking yeah. about you personally. I mean, you're the owner slash huge, GM. I'm not a huge Dak Prescott fan, but, but if you look at it, I saw a meme the other day where it compared his stats to like, Brady and a couple of other quarterbacks, he he has great stats, but at the end of the day, they can't win. You know the big one. Yeah. We'll we'll see if this year's different or not. I mean, every year, you know, the thing about the Dallas Cowboys is they're always going to have the talent. The question is whether or not they're going to be able to put it all together and win. Right? I mean, you got so, Parsons. No, nope. just having yeah, Parsons no, is amazing. Right, no one freak. ever says. And now I mean, Diggs Dallas out. Cowboys always have four, yeah. five, six, eight people in the in the Pro Bowl, right? Yeah. Not that the Pro Bowl matters anymore, but no, Mac Jones is a Pro Bowler because Josh Allen said, <laughs> "I don't want to go." <laughs> right. Like that's so, how he got but, his bid. I'm J10. Baby. But we we always have, you know, yeah. Parsons is a great example, or you know, we always have great talent, but I don't I don't know that we can always put it together for a win. I mean. Is so that, is who that knows? coaching at that point? I don't know, man. Yeah, it's tough. It, it's, it, well, you got yeah, McCarthy you know, now, and, and then obviously uh, Garrett, Garrett was, was horrible. <laughs> My thing is I always want to just see good football. I would rather see a great football game than win the championship, to be honest with you. So, like, this is why I, I really like Colorado this year. Like, you see, everybody last week was like, oh, Colorado's going to get smoked by USC. So watching that game today and seeing them come back in the second quarter, you give Deion Sanders, like, another year or two, nobody's going to be able to beat. Because the program, he's, the, the way he appeals to the, the best of the best guys and the way he kind of gets them motivated to play, um, not only do they have great talent, but, but they're playing as a team. And so, yeah. Yeah, but either way, it's great football. Their I mean, that, defense is like, giving up, n- given up 90 points in the last two weeks. I yeah, mean, that's why, I, that's why I bad. like college football instead of uh, the pros are, is nice because every game matters. That's why I don't like baseball anymore because every, every game doesn't matter. But in, but in football, every game matters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in college football, any fucking thing can happen. This is true. So, yeah. so that's what I love about it. 
We got a big one tomorrow, Bills versus Miami. Yeah, I think you're fucked. <laughs> I, Miami. Don't, I don't. I think right. the Bills are going to win by 10. Hold on. I might need this question for Skip. Skip, I got a fantasy team. I got Tua and Josh Allen as my quarterbacks. Who do I start? And they're playing each other. So who do I start? Tua. All right. Tua. I, I might sure. just do it because Skip said so. Damn. I, I did mean, it last week. And Tua I'm going to just numbers. take – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out here on a whim here. Sorry, Boots. I know you're a diehard Dolphins fan, but uh, – I think the Bills just shut them right down. The Patriots defense shut them down. And it was a Look, close Miami's game. Miami's defense, well, first of all, the thing about one of the most impressive things about the Miami game wasn't the 70 points. It was the fact that they the offense was on the field that long. Mm-hmm. So their defense yeah. is great. So I don't I think the Bills are in a lot of trouble. All right. So if you think my- a lot a lot of trouble. You're just All right. So if Miami is We not- have the fewest points scored against us right now, Skip. You know and we'll and only one team has more points, four, and that's Miami. All right. And it was all in one game. Look, there's nothing more insufferable than a, than anyone from Miami. <laughs> I broke right? a fucking table last year when Miami <laughs> beat us all because right. it was clock management and we didn't spike the ball fast enough. Gio right. was here. He well, saw okay, it. I broke so the like, table. So, so, like, talk about the Jets, right? So I watched uh, the the HBO, what are they called? Hard Knocks. Hard Knocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I enjoyed it. So, so like now you see everybody shitting on the coach and, you know, the quarterback's horrible. It's like, you know, they were talking about going to the Super Bowl before Aaron Rodgers went down. True. Yeah. And I think the Jets have a the Jets have a great defense. Well, Salah, I think, is a really good coach. I think so too. Yeah. I, I like Salah. Great, I think he's a great leader. Like you he's watch that show coach. and you're like I would fucking go to war with that guy. He was yeah, great for the 49- awesome. uh, defensive coordinator for the 49ers. He was great. He's awesome. I, yeah. I mean, I, and I, 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 for any of our Bills fans out there, don't hate me for saying it, but I really do believe Salah is a great coach. Bro, I'm taking the cigar down to the nub, just by the way. It's yeah. going out to the nub. So for me, it's like, I just like people who do it the right way. You yeah. know, I like, I'm just a fan of the sport in general. So. I'll, I'll definitely be watching the, you know, Miami to see. And I'm not much of, I'm not a hater. So, I you know, I don't like seeing people just give up. But uh, as long as it's a good game, you know, it'll be, it'll be fun to watch. Losing to the Jets was like, uh, if we lose to Miami tomorrow, it's going to be a horrible day. I can tell you that right now because I'm going to have fucking Steve fucking texting me <laughs> just talking shit to me and, and it's going to be very similar to uh like we have a lot of listeners in the new york area like new york city long island area uh the amount of texts i got after the jets beat the bills was it was absurd it, it was it, my wife is from long island so the whole family's from there it, it just it was absolutely the worst feeling on earth. It was more than just <laughs> losing a game. It was the amount of texts I got at the end that were like, ah, you fucking suck. But like the shit I talk about the bills, just dominating the division All for right. the last three years. It was, it was horrible. So if we lose to Miami tomorrow, it's going to be a horrible, horrible fucking day. Well, I might. You, you, you ought to brace yourself because I think it's going to be a long day. I don't <laughs> think it's going to be. I think I'm siding with Skip here. I think I'm going to take if Miami's getting plus any points, I'm taking it and I'm betting it. Skip might he might be onto something, so I'm going to listen to him. Well, Miami's on a Miami. You don't just put hang. You don't just hang seventy zero on a team. And I'm going to look at the point spread by the way right now. <laughs> I might have to. Their get the, team I is might, the exact same as it was last year, and we we beat them twice. It's no, we, lo- we lost once. Well, we playoffs. lost once, beat him twice, playoffs. So when it counts. So <laughs> Caleb, do the math here. How many times did we beat him? Well, Just I, like thought I, said, t- I thought you were talking about twice. Beat him twice. But I thought you were talking about okay, so season. I assume, in playoffs. I, assume, I took the plus money, so I, I won. I assume you guys at some point played football. Yeah. I was a defensive end, yeah. Yeah, so this is be- a better conversation than like watching Coop and hearing them talk about sports when you know yeah. Coop never played any organized sport. Ever. That's how pretty much every uh, analyst <laughs> right. is. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Dolphins plus two and a half at plus money. This is not to Might sound like it. misogynistic or sexist, but like I, there's nothing worse to me on earth than watching ESPN and just watching like women tell us about like, well, this guy's not that good, and I'm just like, ugh, dude, you I don't never know, man. Some, of those, 
some some of those uh, some of those ladies are they're way smarter than I am about uh, sports. Well, the one Mina Kimes knows her shit. Uh, I think she. Did got you ever? Her. I don't. I'm not speaking the, for all uh, of them. Some. Did you ever watch the Kevin Costner movie about? I think it's called Draft Day. Yes. Yes. With uh, and, the and he's got and he's got his player coordinator, uh, which is uh, uh, Jessica Alba or whatever, whoever it is, something like that, or Jessica Biel, maybe. Gen- Jennifer Garner or wh- yeah. whatever the fuck it was. But it was like this smart woman that was in his office. It's like there's a lot of those. I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying they don't like, oh, women know nothing about sports, but like sometimes you watch it and you're like, yeah, uh, don't squint when you're reading the teleprompter. <laughs> I, I don't know. Just saying, I took the Dolphins at plus two and a half at plus <laughs> at plus 125. So we'll see if it pays out. <laughs> the dude literally yeah. just threw a pet just in. Just threw it in. That's it. I think that's a good bet. Skip, yeah. uh, if I'm in your DMs and we're talking about that, you know. You know that's why. All right. All right. Now that I have you in the DMs, <laughs> sliding in them, creeping on you. All right. My no boy's weird. Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, here's another question. So you're an old school hip hop guy, right? I see some of your posts that you do on Facebook. Yeah, of course. How do you feel about the recent arrest in the Tupac murder that just happened out in Las Vegas? We just talked about this on an after her, but now an arrest just happened like two days ago. Well, they knew this guy. Yeah. So this guy, a did a, did a, yeah, this guy did a proffer like yeah. back in 2009, or whatever. So they knew he was a, he was kind of the guy who was in charge. I mean, look, at the end of the day, well, everyone knew forever that when Suge Knight and Tupac beat that guy down in the lobby of, of the casino, that that's what caused the, the beef or whatever. Um, so basically, Suge Knight just put up another fatality, you know, basically. <laughs> that dude should definitely be in jail. He where is he in jail. Stay, where he should stay. I think he's in jail forever. He, yeah, he, he should be in jail forever. Listen, yeah. if OJ can go to jail for stealing his own stuff and not murder, Suge Knight can go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I watch, uh, I've been watching um, uh, this show Blue Bloods. I don't know if you guys watch that. I've, I've seen it's it. kind of hard to watch as somebody that does the job. Uh, yeah, well, like for me, so, a more authentic, like a more authentic uh, show would be like The Wire. Yeah, of course. But the, the great thing about Blue Bloods is every show they kind of come across something. It's all interconnected, and then they solve it by the end of the hour, which is great. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I can assure you, in real life, it's not like that. Right, of course. The shit goes on years sometimes. Right. Zero so, leads. Yeah. No one ever wants to help you. Hey, sir, what did you see? I know this man's dead right here on the street. Did you see something? I know you were right there. I ain't see shit. <laughs> That's usually how it goes. Yeah. No snitching. So, yeah. I hope, you know, whatever. <laughs> I, I kind of hope that, uh, I think finding the guys that, that killed him is kind of takes a, a little bit of the shine off the the mythology. The, the mythology, yeah. I mean, we did an episode as Tupac and, and, Biggie's, and Biggie's still alive. alive. Like, so obviously we know. Yeah, they're dead. Yeah. We we knew we know they're dead. Definitely dead. But the whole hip hop world missed out on so much good music that could have happened in the last twenty five years, and it would probably save us from this shit hip hop that's going on now. Skip yeah, I'm would not still be riding around of... with his eight tracks. <laughs> this was this was part of the reason I think John left Roma was I was so uh, against his whole uh, Conway the Machine and uh, some Buffalo guys. All those fucking guys, yeah, yeah. So not, not a personal fan, but different. Yeah, reasons. yeah, not... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so that whole that whole school of music, I'm just not a fan of. It's so weird. Keep it old school. It, it, I just have to touch on this. It's so weird, though, hearing like Conway the Machine and Benny the Butcher and all that. To us, these are guys that like, you know, have nefarious ties and we know things about them that the general public just does not. And like you hear it, every single person. Oh, you're from Buffalo. You got the Bills and Griselda. <laughs> yeah. Griselda, that whole fucking school of music is just fucking horrible. So, <laughs> so I don't even have to know anything about their bullshit. I don't even have to know anything about their bullshit. I just, their music is horrible. <laughs> I'm a big Wu-Tang guy, though. I do like the Wu-Tang. I like the Wu-Tang, but none of those guys are career criminals. 
big that beast, we know of. Big Beastie Boys fan. None of those guys went to jail, I don't think. <laughs> Probably for some <laughs> other stuff. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. No, all they did was like rap about drinking Old English. And Spanish Fly, which could get you in trouble, <laughs> you know. Oh, man. Yeah. Hey, man, they're Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, man. They are, as they should be. So, so you know what's what's interesting to me is, um, so you know you talk about all the taxes and stuff in New York. Um, so I think what really kind of keeps keeps the cigar culture going in New York is, you know, this kind of thing. The you know this, you know, the, the groups of guys who who you know really build a culture, and you know, but you got guys like Tommy and um, guys in the city that that are really trying to you know, make a business out of it. And it's tough. Uh, but I think, you know, I think that's what, what, what I like the most about the cigar world. You know, I don't like the marketing bullshit. I don't like the, uh, you know, all the sniping at each other and the competitive bullshit. But for me, it's just about this kind of thing. You're sitting around with three or four guys talking about, whatever's in the news talking about hip hop or whatever. And, and, you know, so if you, if, if you keep that going, that's how, that's how, that's how the culture survives. Right. Yeah. Do we talk about our like origin story all the time? Like just the show in general. Uh, I mean, I started smoking cigars during COVID. Uh, now I'm, I'm with Mikey and, and, and Palmer and I'm on a network. We're, we're the number one cigar, like the number one show on Podbean right now. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really crazy that just sitting around and, you know, almost humanizing all these great people in the industry. I mean, whether it's you talking to us or we bring in a guy that's like the number one customer at the show, we're going to have the same conversations. We're all humans at the end of the day. And it's really cool to just be able to almost bring in these huge people in the industry and just have these great conversations. Yeah. I mean, I don't really normally get wrapped up in a lot of that. Um, I think a lot of people, and that, that's the thing I don't like about the industry is the whole is the whole cult of personality thing about it. But, um, yeah, for me, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, kind of down to earth, just hanging out, smoking cigars. Yeah. And like to touch on what you said, like what keeps it going is people will spend money on an experience. And if that cigar is $20, but you have two and a half hours, great time smoking with your buddies or even complete strangers, you know, you're going to spend that $20 again. We're creatures of habit. So like what you said, well, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, the $20, it's not even that big of a deal. You, yeah. you talk about what it, what it costs to go to a movie, for example. Oh, you know, for a couple It's more of- than 20 bucks. I can tell you that. Right. But, um, I'll wait for that shit to hit Prime or fucking Netflix. <laughs> Watch that shit for free. I mean, net- well, for whatever the subscription is now. I don't even know. My wife pays it. <laughs> So you pay it. <laughs> I, yeah, whatever. Hey. Are you guys all in the same place? Yeah, we're yeah, all in the, we're same, all room. the same room. Yeah, this is my okay. uh, this is my garage lounge or whatever you want to Here, call I'll give it. you the little uh okay. 360 as you can see. But it's a it's a pretty cool little room. Oh that yeah, that's pretty dope. This is like when we're not in here doing the podcast, we're in here. Watching football on every channel, watching the UFC fights. I think there's a good boxing match on tonight, right? Isn't Canelo, Canelo fighting? Yeah. Yep. Canelo, Canelo, yeah. You know, we're we're in here doing that, so we're yeah. My wife is a big boxing fan. She was telling me about the Canelo fight. Oh yeah, that's that's a big one. He's Man. the two undisputed champions right now. Well, fighting, he lost right? when he went up in weight recently. I just forget the guy's name, but he went. He didn't take the dude seriously. You could just tell. <clears throat> Canelo should have be. I haven't really heard much about the guy he's fighting. It's kind of tough. Like boxing is weird. You have either like four or five really great guys at a time in each weight class, and they all just fight. They don't really fight each other very often. And then when you do, it's like fucking huge news. Like when it was Tank Davis fighting Ryan Garcia recently it was like that was the last boxing well, fight I watched. That fight was so boring to me. Well, when I was younger, 
boxing was a much bigger thing. Because um, sure. you had, you know, you had the whole uh, Hearns, Leonard, Hagler, oh, Triangle, God. and uh, then you had Mike Tyson. But uh, boxing these days, I, I kind of follow uh, this this boxer from Nicaragua, uh, Ruben Gonzalez, the Chocolatito. He's pretty good. Um, he's, a, he's like, a, but he's like a really, he's like a flyweight or something. So Small it's, guy, uh, so it's tougher. Yeah, yeah. That <coughs> the heavyweight division is not as as exciting as it used to be. Well, I mean, we used to have Lennox Lewis, the Klitschko brothers, Tyson. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Jesus, well, just the, and, the people in that division were crazy back then. And nowadays, boxing, you got Jake Paul. <laughs> <laughs> right. That, that's basically what Sucks. it's turned into. Yeah. It's uh, how much money can we make on the celebrity fight? And that's, and that's is, essentially right? what boxing is now. Yeah. That's why I actually look forward to the UFC now. Yeah, you usually see the top guys. It's very rare you don't see the top guys fight each other, which, like... John Jones, he's got his like heaviest weight title defense coming up, so he's from you know Western New York as well, so he's got a big following out here. Uh, you know, McGregor changed the game with MMA. Like that dude, just whatever he touches seems to make money. So good on him. He just needs to probably you know lay off doing the blow or some shit. <laughs> he just yeah, I don't, I don't know. I yeah, I, for me. The, there's been some there's been some really good fights, but I haven't been able to get into it as much as I did when I was younger. Yeah, the personalities are really what make that. Like Floyd Mayweather, you were tuning in because you either loved him or you wanted to see him lose. Like he was just the villain boxing needed. Yeah, but, I used to watch the Mayweather fights just to pray to God you lost. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, I always think like uh, as cons- as cigar consumers, because because I'm a, I'm a cigar consumer, I I buy cigars, but so so many cigars these days, are, are, you know, they're there's so much of a, a disappointment. It's not that they're bad; it's just they're all kind of pretty good. And so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I I kind of agree to that. We I have- don't. It's hard to find one that sucks nowadays. So we haven't had a bad rated cigar in almost a year or so. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's just there's so many of them that I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even spend money on because because you know they're just so derivative, right? So here's a little and, question, and they're and they're getting so expensive. What do you, uh, what if you weren't smoking Roma Craft and stuff that you blend? Is there a, is there a brand that you like? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of them. Um, you know. What what I like is finding something that that is like okay this is really exceptional, and and it doesn't usually stay exceptional, um, which is kind of part of the problem. Um, like I, um, but then there's the the classics that I always kind of go back to right. So pretty much anything by La Florida Minicana, I think it's always really good, uh, but you can't always find it. It's a problem. I left these a little uh, tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's uh, and then there's a lot of Padron uh, that I like. Padron is not a great cigar objectively. Uh, you know, it's not constructed really well. The tobacco is not super complex. The they're not pretty cigars, but but I like the flavor. The problem with that is that they're overpriced, right? But man, you're you're telling me here in New York, if I want to smoke a Padron, uh, it could just be the Padron two thousand. Uh, you're talking twenty five dollars. Yeah, it's, it's so almost it's almost unsmokable here. Well, and you know every cigar costs two dollars to make. And so this he, this is not to to compare Roma Craft to Padron, but I could have that same experience of enjoyment, and I right. can pay fourteen dollars, thirteen dollars. Yeah, and, and I have just been me, an amazing. For me, experience. I try I try to smoke a little bit of everything just because I like to kind of see what's going on. Sure, but there's not very many things I smoke anymore where I'm like, I, I need to get a box of these. I need to get more of these. So, uh, but as a cigar consumer, it's like you want, especially if you guys have a podcast or whatever, you want to go out there and try new things. It, it's got to be disappointing where things come in. It's like, yeah, this is pretty good. It doesn't suck, but it's like. 
why is it fifteen dollars? Why is it eighteen dollars? Why is, you know what I mean? Well, here we know it's the tax. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why I try to buy. I I mean I don't want to sound like a jerk here to any of our brick and mortars, but that's why I try to buy outside of New York. If I'm buying a box, if I'm buying a single or two. All right, yeah, you support your brick and mortar, but if I'm buying a box, I'm not going to pay $150 more. I'm I'm going to go and make sure I'm not paying the fucking insane tax on it. Yeah. yeah. I but, mean, uh, yeah, I get that. To touch on what you were saying as far as, like, unique flavors, like, I'm trying to think of, like, what stood out to me that we've smoked, because we smoke a lot. I'd say the last, like, different tasting, and I don't even know... I, obviously, my palate is probably a fraction of what yours is, but like the uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, that was the one that I smoked that just had a, a very unique flavor profile. Like that was what EP Carrillo did. It was like their Fourth of July release, and I guess like because it had like four nation tobacco and there was a lot behind it. Like that stood out to me as a very very unique flavored cigar. Um. That's well, no matter what the story is, if you liked it, you liked it, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing is, it's like I just like finding cigars that are like, okay, this is not the same bullshit I, I always get. Yeah. I so, have that with uh, if there was like a real a cigar that I really I did not like the Vitola on this, but uh, Pravada put out a like collaboration cigar with Casada, their uh, barbecued pig. And I don't know what it is about that cigar, but the flavor is amazing. However, the Vitola, you just, you fight it for two hours. Uh, You hate every second of fighting the cigar, but I really like the flavor of it. Yeah, they had a cigar, Casada had a cigar for a while. It was called Espana. It was really, really good. Oh, all right. Here, Skip, I got another question for you. Speaking about taxes and all that. How do you feel about some of the most recent bills like that one it's it got snuck into like the mama the mama care act where they're going to quadruple or triple taxes on uh cigars and all tobacco products? Yeah, that's Dick Durbin. I mean, he yeah, I think he, he he I don't know what his fucking problem is, but he's, he's just like a Yeah, fuck that guy. Yeah, he hates <laughs> yeah, cigars. Right? He sounds like a lame yeah. guy. Gets gets yeah, no pussy. He's a, he's on a fucking mission. <laughs> um <laughs> Just say it, or that, or yeah. that, like that one in Pennsylvania where, like, if it passes, the only place you could smoke a cigar is at your own residence. Yeah, fuck those people too. <laughs> yeah, suck. <laughs> Lame. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. You guys are cops, so I don't know how you feel about this. But like for me, it's like I don't care if they decriminalize heroin. Like for me, it's it's one of those things where. I feel like if you're an adult, you should be able to basically do kind of what you want to do. And um, the the whole tax it and regulate it and and that whole thing, you know, we have this intemperance line, which is all based on the on the idea that you can never really make anything illegal. True. It just all that does is create this black market for people who want who provide the thing that people want, right? So, like, people talk about making porn illegal. But they're the same guys, you know, jacking off the porn, you know. Like, if you look at the red states, like, you know, Alabama, Georgia, whatever, they have the weirdest fucking porn search, you know. (laughs) I'm just going to take a wild guess. It might be stepbrother, stepsister, something like that. Stepmom. So it's like, you know, my problem is, you know, you you try to find porn that's not weird. It's impossible. (laughs) You You know. just you know, normal missionary. To, yeah, you used to, you, you could watch you could watch a movie on Cinemax, or you could you could you know get some, a Playboy or something, and it was good enough. And now it's like you know somebody an a, you know an amputee fucking their stepmom biracial <laughs> with a you know with a stump or something. It's like you can't even oh, man. You can't even find normal porn it's anymore. It's all these AI generated search topics. You know that's how you get to this weird <laughs> shit. Not that I would know. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I don't but, know, Caleb. If, you probably searched some weird fucking shit, dude. Never. <laughs> like, but if you're into that, I mean, it's like whatever. I, you know, it doesn't bother me. You know, um, <sighs> in that way, I, I feel like people should kind of be able to do what they want. You know, if you, if you add on top of that, like, I, you know, I've been smoking 
no bullshit. I've been smoking at least, I don't remember, unless I was in the hospital or whatever, when I had COVID maybe, I smoked five cigars a day, 10 cigars a day for 30 something years, you know, and I'm not saying I'm like in the best health of any human being on the planet, but I don't think it has anything to do. I think it has more to do with Coca-Cola than it has to do with, with, uh, cigars, right? All those toxic chemicals. Yeah. Oh, and who knows right. what's in Coke? Yeah. W- whatever it is, it's like, uh, cigarette smoking and cigar smoking are two completely different things. hundred percent. So, yeah, <clears throat> so it's the, it's like, it's like, it's like all the, all the stuff during COVID. It has nothing to do with science. It has everything to do with um, kind of the virtue signaling and the taking sides. Yeah. <laughs> it's like green energy, right? Like if you want to put solar panels on your house or have an electric car or whatever, I feel like that's do what you want to do. But, you know, people, you know, the same people who are preaching to you about about climate change you're taking private jets everywhere you know what i mean yeah yeah so it's so it's it's like one of these things where um it, it's it's this irrational when you, when you actually start looking at things it's it's like this arra- like when, when these when these politicians who spend you know billions of dollars on bullshit start talking about people who get money for for food stamps it's like the food stamps is like a multi, multi, multi decimal point rounding error of all the other boat. You know, we spend, you know, the jet, the, the, the F 35, whatever fucking jet that crashed. You know, <laughs> we did an episode about it. Was Where it the fuck is that dollar? jet? How the fuck yeah. can you lose that goddamn jet? How, how it's could a, you lose it's that? It's a hundred million dollar plane, right? Or, or whatever it is. It's like, is people are so subjective about the things that they that they care about, I guess. So, I, I I'm just like you know, just be a decent fucking person, be fair, you know, like you know, like our going back to our cigars. I know what it costs to make our cigars. We actually, it actually costs us more to make cigars than what it costs most people because of the way we buy tobacco and what we pay our people, et cetera. But we could still sell cigars and make a good living selling it, you know, a cigar for eight dollars that all these other people sell for twelve, fourteen, fifteen dollars. Am I an idiot for not selling for fifteen? I don't know, but I'm living pretty good. So the my thing about it is, I just have to stay focused on my little piece and do what I think is right. And you know, you do what you fucking think is right and you know, you, you know, unless it's affecting me, you know, I don't know what else, you know, I don't have any really domain over it. I I don't think. I mean, you're part of the industry. You've seen it inside and out. Uh, all we can go on is what you say. Uh, you know, you, you know, the true cost of making a cigar, hearing that a cigar costs $2 to make. I mean, we we know that's probably very realistic. Uh, these things. Okay, well let me, let me let me let me say it like this. So I, every Friday and Saturday I watch uh, the live on what is it called live on patrol or uh, live PD live PD. Yeah, but it, they call it something else now, right? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Live PD is not allowed to be a thing. I forgot about that. Yeah, they yeah, canceled it during that. they canceled it uh, during COVID because of the. The riots and shit. Yeah, so I'll sit here and I'll watch that with Jeff. And, like, we'll be watching one thing and we're like, oh, man, that, that cop's being a dick. It's like, you know, why is he going over the top? And then you'll watch the next segment and you're like, I would have smacked the shit out of that guy. So you know my I mean? father has the same exact ideology that you have. Uh, it's my dad's like. Man, I watched this guy. He stopped the dude because he was just walking down the street stumbling a little bit. And next thing you know, the dude's getting arrested because he has a warrant. He's just like, dude, leave the fucking guy alone. And then the next, he's like, there's some crazy situation. He's like, yeah, I probably would have shot the guy. 
and, and well, then it, yeah. it's the same shit. He's just like sometimes yeah, I mean, they're I, so ridiculous. I can tell you right now, I would be the worst fucking police officer on the planet. You know what Guaranteed. you should do, Skip? You should you should come up to Buffalo and do to uh, do like a ride along with me and Geo. <laughs> I can tell you right now, I would be the worst because here's how I know. <laughs> I'll be watching the show and I'll be like, "Why is he fucking with that guy?" You know, that guy hasn't done anything wrong. He's just he's just fucking being a dick to that guy. And then the guy's got like fucking a, a meth lab in his trunk, you know, or, 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 or a dead like, body. Or what the f- Wait, then, hold on. This guy's a piece of shit. We don't want this guy in the community. But yeah, why did yeah. you fuck with that guy in the first place? Right. And then the next the next thing is like they pull this guy over and they start cutting him a break. And I'm like, what? if that guy talked to me like that, it'd be like, fuck that guy, you know? Mm hmm. So it's, it's, it's like it's, it's a difficult job. It really dude, is a difficult job. Until no you do it or do. or do like a ride along and you can truly see the job. It, it's it's some days you come home and you're like, I made a difference. And some days you come home and you're like, wow, I had all these horrible experiences today and I did nothing and I couldn't do well, anything. I, I watch it and I think not only would I not be a good cop. I'm not even a good referee for the cop <laughs> because because I call it wrong so many times, you know. So I think it's just like this cumulative effect of it's like you get good guys who have the right temperament, who have the right judgment, and it's like God bless those guys because I couldn't do it. But at the same time, it's like once you if you do it all day every day, you just build up this like sixth sense about. Who are the dirt bags and who are not the dirt bags? I watch it with my wife talking about the Sixth Sense. Like we'll we'll watch the show sometimes on TV, and I'll be like, "Yeah, a guy's got a gun in the car." And my wife's like, "You didn't even see the episode." I'm like, "He's got a gun in the car." I'm telling you, he has a gun in the car. It, it's an illegal gun. It's in the car. I I promise you to God, it's in the car. Sure as fuck. Like like I didn't call it. She'll be like, "How the fuck did you know?" I'm like, "I'm telling you, I talk to these people every day. There's a gun right. in the car." There's an illegal right. gun in the car. And she's right. just like, she's mind blown that I knew it. I'm like, I literally called it. I literally knew what was in the car. You, you right. just, and, you get and this. 90, 98% of the time, and you guys do the job. So you know the guys you work with mm-hmm. who you're like, that guy should not be on this job. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 100%. And so, so my thing is, it's like, if if a if a cop gets into a situation and something bad happens, and you, and you talk to eight other cops and you say, "Tell me about that guy," he's like, "That that's a good guy." You're like, "Okay, whatever the fuck happened, he just did his job." If if whatever if if they're like, "Oh, that guy, this was this was bound to happen," it's like, "Get that guy off the job," you know, but because, but I, I I know again, it's like I know I couldn't do it. It's like it's like in the Navy, there there were certain guys as soon as they showed up to the ship, you're like, This guy's not gonna last. You you know right off the bat by the way he carries them. And it it has nothing to do with how brave they are or how smart they are. It's just the it's just the you know immediately this guy is not gonna work out. No, I totally understand that. I, I see that all the time. Yeah. Or teachers. It's like I couldn't be a good teacher. Oh, and, you know, yeah, when no. you talk about cops, it's got this political loaded thing. But it's like I couldn't be a good teacher either. I do not have the patience. Fuck those kids. <laughs> I, like, right? I'll, I'll be doing quote. homework with my own kid. And I, you know, I'll be doing homework with Fiorella. And I'll be like, come on. Are you fucking stupid? You know, it, it, I don't have the patience for it. So no, it's I'm, like bless, bless those people. There's certain people built for it. I'm not one of them. Listen, Skip, as we're winding down for the episode, I just want to thank you uh, for coming on with us. You know, it's it's been a great experience hanging out with you for the last almost two hours. Uh, dude, is there anything you want to close with? Anything you want to tell our listeners about? Any any new projects you're working on? The, the floor is yours. No, man, I just really dig that you guys, you know, I know this, you guys getting together to do this and... and doing the editing and the time you, you spend away from your families or whatever, do this, you know, it pushes the culture forward and I, I appreciate it. And, um, you know, for me, it's like, I'm not trying to sell anything, you know, we're going to sell everything we make no matter what I, you know, I'm not here to market anything or, um, you know, I just, for me, I spend every day 
you know, it's kind of ha- it's kind of partially uh, just because I love cigars, but but it's really become you know kind of really developing and nurturing these guys that work at the factory, and so you know. I would. I mean, there's nothing else I'd. I'd rather be doing. I certainly wouldn't be a cop or a teacher, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but I mean, I just. I like that you guys dig. You know, a lot of guys. You know, they they're good at marketing and selling, and they put their name on something someone else makes. And the cigar you guys are smoking today is kind of that for me. You know, some other guy made it. I mean, I put I put in the work, um, but I just like making things. I, I like I like having a company where the thing that we're making money on is something that I made, right? Every, you know, every little decision about the packaging or the blend or the how we bought the tobacco or how you know the, helping the guy who, who you know who made the cigar with his sick kid or or whatever it is, I just like being a part of that, and so. The fact that I can just make a living doing this is for me, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know if I could go back to a real job, <laughs> you know, so I, I really love doing it. And, and I love that you guys are out there putting your time in to, to, you know, keep that going. So I appreciate it. Well, man, we appreciate the culture. We appreciate the products that Roma Craft puts out. We appreciate you as a blender and what you guys do as, as far as, uh, putting things out that we enjoy. So. Uh, thanks for joining the show, Skip. And uh, yeah, man, we'll uh, we'll be in touch, man. We'll we'll definitely have to do this again. Yeah, and I, I, I'm put a pretty decent dent in this bottle, I think. Good. Yeah, hey, oh, hey, let's see it. Let's, let's see how see much it. is left. Yeah, uh, there's a lot left. I, I I probably did about. Oh yeah, it's a pretty good pour, <laughs> bro. We've been taking this thing down for a little bit, man. We've been taking down this. <laughs> me and you, Jay. Which one? Well, is that? Yeah, I was gonna say that's pretty much me and Caleb. Oh, that's we, uh, uh Starlight. Starlight. Mm. Yeah. You guys are gonna get me drunk, so hey, good. Enjoy. Listen, it's a good night's sleep. That's true. You know. Hey, I'll, I'll be drunk. We're I'll be pre-gaming drunk this Bills week. game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I think I think uh, we're gonna be texting tomorrow about the big win. Oh shit! The big right. Miami win. Oh man, I'll he's be- already got the the fuck you story planned already. <laughs> Skip, take this how, how you want to take it. Uh, I mean it in the friendliest way. But if you think that's going to happen, go fuck yourself. <laughs> all right. I, I don't. Ha- I don't have a horse in the race. So all right. Just, all right. Now, now knowing you guys have skin in the game, it's gonna be funner to watch. If the if my bet hits, Skip, I'll be in the DMs. <laughs> all right. Now that we're uh, friends officially. Okay. All right, Although man. I didn't meet you in person, but I will. Uh, next PCA. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but uh, thanks I'm, for joining, always, man. We I'm appreciate it. Hey, the I appreciate you saying it. We got to use that for a clip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. We'll talk to you. All right, guys. See you, yeah, brother. Man. Thank you. Oh, do we got to tell him to keep that open? Great interview. No, no, oh, I, yeah, I think yeah, we're right. no, no. He is. Uh, he had an actual connection there. Okay, because yeah. I just saw everything close quickly. So I was no, like, no, no, no. I think the home internet stuff makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. He wasn't at a factory or anything. But uh, Caleb, did you have a cigar review for this bud? I'm done already, man. Uh, I gotta. I'm, I've been done. I'm on cigar number two already. So uh, I'll just kick things right off uh, right away. Appearance on this bad boy. I gave it an eight. I like the color of the band. Uh, you know, it's pretty original with everything that Romacraft does. So, eight for appearance. Uh, burn, I did one touch up. It got an eight and a half out of me. Construction, man, this thing constructed very nice. Had a nice stack of dimes. Uh, it ashed anytime like I wanted it to. I had to tap this thing. So, construction, nine and a half. Uh, I did a straight cut for the draw, uh, going with a nine as well. And, man, overall enjoyment. We smoked this with the. Uh, skip himself so nine and a half uh my notes on this thing great smelling wrapper uh, i got dark chocolate and mocha a little bit of peppery spice uh midway through and it uh, left this aftertaste of some uh real minerally and earthy like to me so overall score for me was a 44 and a half times it by two you get an 89 for your boy caleb right here so uh whoever wants to go next i mean feel free to take it away uh love this thick man third time smoking it it's been uh, the same each smoke, always good. What was your total again? You said eighty nine. Okay, perfect. Uh, I can get into mine. Uh, the appearance I gave it a eight. 
Uh, just a simple band. It almost looks like every Roma band. Uh, Quinquagenaria is what it says. Instead of Cro-Magnon or Aquitaine or Neanderthal. Uh, nothing truly different about the band. Uh, however, the burn on the cigar. I didn't really have to touch mine up. I'm actually smoking my second one during the show. Uh, I gave it a 9.5. This thing is awesome. Construction also a 9. Draw a 9. And... Dude, we just sat down for an hour and 49 minutes with Skip Martin himself. The enjoyment, I gave it a 9.5. Bring me to a 45 overall, 90. Uh, this cigar is so fucking good. If you have the opportunity to purchase this thing, get out there, smoke it. Uh, only 1,000 boxes of 24. Not that many out there. Do what you can to get it. This thing is amazing. Uh Listen, I can't even really describe how this cigar tastes. Uh, not because it's just so different from all cigars. And it, if you guys do go out there and you get it, reach out to me. Let me know what you guys thought of it. This thing to me was amazing. What so. about any uh, tasting notes or anything that you picked up? Uh, really smoky stick too, by the way. It's smoky. Uh, the tasting notes, uh, even like on the cold draw and the smell. I mean, this thing just smells like a cocoa bomb. Really, really good. Uh Dude, this thing has some kind of a unique taste to it that I really can't describe. So uh, I'm going to pass it over to Gio. Obviously, in 90s, are really good in my book. So, Gio, what'd you think? All right. The Quinquagenario by Romacraft in collab- well, made out of the E.P. Carrillo factory. So appearance, I gave it an 8.5. It is a different box than you normally see from your, like, Romacraft definitely you know the dual-sided shelving in it i guess you could call that or separator maybe not that but it definitely was made to stand out a little bit more than your normal uh cro neanderthals or baca style uh boxes then uh so that's where that 8.5 came from from me burn i gave it an 8.5 as well i touched it up a couple times just i had a small uh uh unevenness but once that was done i didn't have to touch it up at all but that happens we're smoking a fucking plant and i'm not gonna hold it to construction this is one of the you know shining aspects for it here obviously you know you heard throughout this episode skip is very very meticulous and learned every bit he could to make sure we got a wonderful product in our hands by the time it made its way to store shelves uh from the way things were bunched that I learned things about the actual manufacturing process that without talking to him, I don't think we would ever know. Like this guy knows his shit and you could tell the engineering background came in full effect because he thinks about everything. Uh, so that was where it's really shined in the construction. I gave that a nine draw. I also gave it a nine. I V cut it. Uh, first time V cutting this cigar. I smoked it with a straight cut. I've smoked it with a punch the V, this thing just smokes well no matter how. Uh, Caleb, you straight cut yours as well, you said? Indeed, I did. Same for you, Jer? Yes. No, I uh, I straight cut mine. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I've had a great experience with punches, all that. Doesn't matter how you cut it, you're going to like this cigar, and the draw isn't going to be a problem for you if you don't. Enjoyment, 10 got to hear about everything that went into it obviously every cigar has a story this is a very you know unique and personal one for skip i look forward to the second part when you know mike's edition comes out so i'm sure jerry you'll have another five boxes of those say it laying around somewhere perhaps i will but that brought my total score to a 45 bringing it to a 90 <laughs> poor geo is, is a little cold i can yeah uh, I had the sniffle, so I didn't really taste much as far as that goes. Like to, you know, I think the thing I like most about this is the consistent uh, mellowing out feel. It gives me the strength of the tobacco. It's not the punch in the mouth. You just feel good. That smooth ride you get from it, if that makes sense. Yeah, of but. course. Caleb, how'd we do, bud? <laughs> All right. So the three of us, it's a 89.66. You round that up, 90. Perfect. Yeah, great stick. Yeah. That being said, any closing notes to the episode, buddy? Uh, I feel like we're missing something. Um, we'll get to it later. But um, how'd you guys think of that with the starlight? Oh, yeah. It was really, really good. No, yeah, we. I have something to do after this, but yes, we'll, uh, we'll the starlight it. was good. Yeah, 
I mean, that's one that I think Jeff put March put us on, and I'm happy we actually got to drink one of their like normal expressions, not like a not to shit on single barrel picks or anything like that. I just like to actually try what it, you know know what they're trying to put out there, and yeah, it was a very pleasant experience. All right. With that being said, I'd like to just hit up. Just make sure you guys are subscribing to the YouTube page, Grower Gang, growing very well. So uh, make sure you're checking out all our videos on YouTube. Hit up the Facebook, the Instagram, and the TikTok. Just make sure you're in tune with everything out there. Uh, appreciate the likes, the comments, and all our subscribers. Uh, keep on the likes and comment. Uh, what you like to see us smoke, review, drink as well? So hit us up. We're, we'll answer. That being said, guys, if you're listening to us audio only, make sure you're checking us on uh, Cigar Hustlers Podcast Network, the number one cigar podcast on Podbean. Uh, that being said, buddy, we'll smoke uh, if you got them. Smoke them if you got them, and we'll see you guys next Wednesday. Ski, ski, yay! Oh, God.